I was doing the United States Antarctic Service Expedition, uh, which was 1939 uh, to 41. And um, so the, the East Base, which is the US base, and then there's Base E, which is the UK base. The East Base uh, was part of a large expedition. Um, it was overall commanded by Richard um, Admiral Byrd. Um, he was over on the far side of the continent at West Base, so it was called East Base uh, on this side. Um, and uh, I've got a few slides actually depicting um, getting that base established. Uh, here's one of two ships that came into the area. There was the North Star and the Bear. Um, and here are the men uh, at the early stage of 1940 unloading supplies onto the north western side of Stonington um, to build East Base. Here, uh, the men actually built a number of buildings. They got their first building, their first quarters built within one week, so they were out of tents, um, out of the ships. The ships left, left 26 men uh, ashore, plus 75 dogs, um, and a number of aircraft uh, and some tanks as well. I don't know whether any tanks, but uh, some tracked vehicles. Um, this was part of uh, part of the main structure that was designed by the Army Corps of Engineers. So here's the team um, establishing that. Um, and here's them all together uh, for the mid-winter party. <coughs> um, I did mention, so they had planes, they had dogs, they had radios. It's much like the BGLE expedition in terms of their outfitting. They had actually um, a lot more military equipment as well. But this is a Curtis Condor plane, so it's significantly more powerful a tool than Rymel's plane, um, capable of longer journeys. Um, again, it could land uh, on snow and, and on ice as well. Um, a simplified chart showing um, some, of their, some of their journeys. So they were in the vicinity, similar vicinity of Rymel and the British Groundland Expedition, which were fur they were further north. Um, but Stonington Island, plane, they were uh, operating planes and sledges. Um, the commander was a, a chap called Richard Black. Admiral Byrd was over on the far side. Richard Black and Finn Rod were down in this area. Richard Black was really tasked with um, uh, being uh, he was on, on, on all of the plane flights. Um, and he wasn't a pilot, but he was um, certainly charged with his um, coordinating with them regarding weather. Um, Finn Rod and Carl Eklund um, were some of the more experienced dog team handlers, dog drivers, and they actually made um, a 1,264 mile journey all the way down George the Sixth Sound um, to establish that Alexander the First Island was indeed an island. Remember, I was telling you about the BGLE, they pretty much were able to separate it from the mainland. But uh, Stevenson of the BJL had to turn around uh, in about this area here, um, whereas they continued and saw open water and large icebergs um, and could definitely then declare it uh, an island. Um, Black's uh, flights were uh, unprecedented. He was flying over virgin territory down the east coast of the peninsula. Um, so that was a, another major accomplishment. Um, and also, um, there was the first crossing of the Antarctic Peninsula and um, a dog team went over and tracked down uh, the east coast as well. Um, the dog team actually turned around before the flights turned around and around about this area here, both of the engines on the plane stopped and for about 60 seconds as they were descending down into the Weddell Sea, um, there was no sound at all and the engines were totally dead. And uh, Richard Black later writes in his, in his notes, um, obviously they were extremely terrified. Um, he said it was the quietest thing this side of the grave um, that he'd ever not heard. Um, but later they just uh, realized it was just the fuel uh, the engines switching to uh, new fuel, fuel tanks. So nothing to be alarmed about at all. Um, but yeah, very, uh, very long 60 seconds, I would say. Uh, what do we have here? Oh, here's a great shot. This is, uh, so this is Stonington here. Um, this is where we started the morning in this area here. We sent out scout boats um, here and then we repositioned um, sort, of, sort of to the south and um, trending south anyway um, and cruised uh, up here. Um, so you can see clearly that the reason this 
island was chosen for such an expedition was that it had access um, up onto the peninsula. They could take dog teams up there. Um, you can actually see dog tracks um, down here. There's a, a sledge track. Um, and then you can see sledge tracks in this area here. So there was an ice ramp that was about 100 yards wide. Um, it was a fairly simple climb up onto the Northeast Glacier, but when you got up here, so this is the route that they took up here, avoiding obviously this heavily crevassed area, extremely dangerous. Um, still lots of crevasses here to be wary of. Um, they would come stuck in here. Um, here's a heavily crevassed area, so they would then go around here. And then up this area, and you can't actually see where the Peninsula Plateau tops off, but it's around 6,000 feet or so, five and a half, six thousand 6,000 feet. Um, th this is the bottom of actually a new final climb up onto the plateau, uh, and it was called um, Soda Bread Slope, but um, that was in polite, uh, polite company, and um, it was actually named by the men, uh, the British men, uh, particularly the FIDS, the Falkland Island Dependency Survey men, as Sodomy Slope, because they got punished so much going up and down that, it was extremely <laughs> difficult. Um, and this is just, yeah, I, I took this from a book we have in the library, um, uh, a book by um, someone that some of us know, uh, Rick Atkinson, who was a bass uh, dog driver. Um, and uh, sometimes they had to take apart all of their equipment and their sledges and just man haul them up, really steep ice place, uh, places, including all the dogs. <coughs> and there's you know, sometimes 20, 25 dogs in one team. Um, so it took some time. But um, great, great image. Um, the uh, another expedition I wanted to, mem uh, to mention is the uh, the rare, the Rani uh, Antarctic Research Expedition. There's another American expedition. Um, Finn Ron, who was on the um, the first expedition with Admiral Byrd, Admiral Byrd's commanding expedition, uh, he was. Um, wanted to put together a privately funded um, research trip down here um, and he eventually actually, he actually brought it along his wife that's his wife on the on the uh, on the left uh, her name was uh, Edith um, but she went by Jackie uh, he made a decision in Chile to bring her along to help with some administrative tasks and to help with press releases that he was planning on sending um, whilst he was down in the Antarctic because his native language is actually Norwegian, so um, he thought it would be a good idea to bring her along. Um, the men actually really strongly objected to having a woman um, down overwintering with them. Uh, she was one of the first women to overwinter. Um, they eventually uh, came round to the idea, but said, well, if we have one, we, we should have two. Two is better than one. Uh, at least they can keep each other entertained. Um, so. On the left here, we have uh, Harry Darlington. He was another vet from the, the previous expedition that I was talking about. Um, and his wife was with them in Chile at the time. So he basically uh, had to conscript her. She didn't want to go, um, but she ended up going. And, and that was a historic first, uh, the first women to, to uh, overwinter down in Antarctica. Um, those two men, um, Ronnie and uh, Darlington, would end up falling out um, during the expedition and uh, the men got split at one point and you, know, you have to take sides essentially and um, the two wives uh, took opposing sides obviously siding with their husbands um, and didn't speak at all so the only two women in Antarctica were not even talking to each other <laughs> which is quite amusing um, Jenny actually became pregnant as well whilst down there and uh, didn't, didn't tell her previous friend Jackie uh, that she was pregnant at all. Neither of the Ronnies knew that she was pregnant until two months or so after they found out. Um, we had quite a lot of cloud today and quite a lot of fog um, at times. Um, but here's the British base E. And just in the really bottom left corner you can see uh, the rooftops of the uh, East base uh, of the US. And you'll remember from being out in the Zodiacs, this body of water where the ship was anchored over here and there was a, a body of water. This body of water that you can just see peeking through is four miles uh, from the southern end of the island. So um, quite an imposing image uh, indeed. It definitely dominates uh, the base. 
Um, I threw this slide in as well because it just shows what the top of the Antarctic Peninsula looks like. Um, both of the US expeditions established uh, the first meteorological or the first high alt altitude meteorological stations that had any sort of permanency at all in the peninsula region. So we're talking again 6,000 feet, maybe more in some places up to 7,000 feet. Um, this is what the, the dog teams were uh, climbing, um, up catwalks like this, narrow areas where they would have to actually unclip the dogs and take them one by one because they were worried that they might hang a left or hang a right. And once they got up the top here, they were pretty much free to go on very, very expansive sled journeys up and down the peninsula and over into the Weddell Sea on the far side. Uh, but the first two, uh, first two expeditions established uh, meteorological stations took up hydrogen tanks and sent up uh, the second one sent up 25 um, balloons, hydrogen weather balloons. Um, two men actually atop there got in a, in a serious condition and during some severe storms that lasted days and days. Uh, Ronnie lost radio communication with his two men uh, up on the up on the weather station, and they had fallen in a crevasse um, whilst trying to retreat down to the base. Um, one, got, one had gotten out, he didn't go in so deep, but one was 100 feet down in the crevasse, wedged in, and he couldn't get himself out. And uh, the one, the other man escaped, got down to the station, um, and got the search team, the combined search team of British and Americans, um, they had started to cooperate by that point. Um, and they got him out, and he was in there for 10 hours, um, just trapped 100 feet down in this icy, uh, icy uh, prison, but he was completely <coughs> unscathed no uh, lasting injuries whatsoever. So, um, so pretty gruesome conditions. Uh, you guys might have noticed actually a, a cross today um, on the northern, northwestern side of the island. Um, that's actually a memory of um, um, two British dog teams. Uh, they were um, uh, John Noel and uh, Thomas Allen. They were the dog drivers of two dog teams called the Trogs and the Moomins. Um, and they were heading out for a jolly. They were trapped at the base and they were getting sort of cabin <coughs> fever and it was towards the end of the season. It was 1966, um, so just British in the area at the time. They, they went up on the northeast glacier and got quite high up and then the catabatic winds came in. The catabatic winds are winds blowing really fast down, picking speed up on ice caps and down glaciers and they can pick up extreme speed, over, over 100 knots. And these catabatic winds came on. They were, they were known by the, uh, by the FIDs as the fumigators, again, in polite company, in uh, impolite company, they were known as the fornicators, um, but they got caught in them. So 100 knot winds, they, they radioed down and said they were going to dig in, and uh, four days later, they, they hadn't had any communication or the norn had come down the mountain, um, so they sent the team up, and what they found were um, one individual half buried in snow, face down, um, some four dogs near him, and the other individual was um, up to his neck, it's just his hands out, frozen solid in the snow. Um, and what they think happened was um, they dug in, they didn't realize how, how hard the wind was blowing, how much snow was accumulating and how quickly, and one went out to check on the dogs, because you had to go check on the dogs at that point, the dogs had already suffocated, they would have been drowned essentially in powder snow, um, couldn't find his way back. Then the other man crawled halfway out to try and call him back in and took, would have fallen asleep in the snow, just exhausted, and both were found later. So that's what the cross was there for. They're actually buried there and they, they brought the bodies down and they found them. Um, during the, uh, the Americans' uh, second expedition down there, um, again, they brought planes with them, and they brought dogs, but the dogs didn't really fare so well on the, on the passage south. Half of their dogs died um, crossing down the Chile. Um, so when they got down, um, there was a bit of a hostile reception with the British, because the British were there, and the Americans didn't feel that uh, the island, the island's resources could support two major expeditions. So there was a little bit of back and forth, but eventually they all got along because they realized, well, we have some strengths. We've got three planes. They have some strength, they've got excellent dogs, they're about 120 to 150 dogs down there, they were all really, really excellent. Um, and so they started to work together, they, the 
would support each other. Um, the Americans would fly their planes, the British only had one Oscar plane, so not very long range, but they would use that plane as well um, and start laying depots for each other. Um, and what really came out of the expedition, the major thing that came out of the expedition was a long range flight. Um, there's, a, there's a southern base here, Cape Keeler, um, where some planes would come and lay some fuel, and then another plane would come, a Beechcraft would come and refuel from another fuel depot further south, and then um, Finn Ronay would actually fly and discover the ice shelf, the, so the southern extremity of the Weddell Sea. It had never been seen before. It was the last major gap um, on the Antarctic coastal map, um, and that is essentially the the one that, the one thing that came out of it. He named it the Lassiter uh, Shelf Ice at the time, and the um, Edith Ron Land, which didn't actually take. Um, it became the, the Ron Ice Shelf um, a little later on. Um, Another name I've mentioned is Richard Black, um, who was in command of that first expedition, and he um, gets a mention the Richard Black Coast here. So it's a major, uh, major work that went into that. Um, another few images I've thrown in. Um, here's the, the British base, so uh, the more colourful one that we were seeing today during winter, and the US base here. You can see the various dog tracks, uh, sledge tracks coming off. Um, and all these dots here are dogs. So there's about, there's about 50 there, but they would have up to 150 uh, on this small island, so extremely difficult to manage all of these dogs um, tethered up everywhere. They'd actually leave some up on the glacier tethered up, but they're quite happy there. Um, here's a, uh, an image from up on the top of the Northeast Glacier, actually up towards the Pen Peninsula Plateau. So this is the route that they're taking up from, um, from down below in Stonington. And here's the, the, um, the bridge that we talked about. Um, I'm sure the drivers would have mentioned it today in your Zodiac. Someone actually asked me today, or yesterday, if, 